Hi everyone, welcome to or welcome back to my channel. Today is Sunday, which means that I talk about true crime and do my makeup at the same time. If that is something that you enjoy, then let's get into it. Warning, please note that this true crime story is meant for mature audiences only, as it discusses crime scenes and may use adult language. So please use your discretion when watching this video. And as usual, before, before I get into anything, I do want to just say that I mean no disrespect to the families or anyone involved in these cases. So let's get into it. I think today I'm going to go for a more going out look, more hectic look today. So on September 19th, 1992, two trail runners were running through Belangolo State Forest and they actually came across two decomposing bodies which were hidden under some debris. And unfortunately to these trail runners and to the public, this was only the start of what was to come. The Belangolo State Forest is around 3,800 hectares wide and long and it is located in the southern highlands of Australia. And near the Belangolo State Forest is a really well-known or well-used highway called Hume. And this highway runs between Sydney and Canberra. So back in the day, around the 1990s, hitchhiking was actually really common and um, a lot of people would see it as adventurous and something really risky to do. And also the Australians or even tourists would find it as a really inexpensive way of traveling. Although it wasn't safe, obviously, and actually encouraged it in some of their 1980s adverts. The government actually used adverts such as this one. America, you look like you need a holiday, a fair income holiday. In the land of wonder, the land down under. Now there's a few things I've got to warn you about. Firstly, you're gonna get wet because the place is surrounded by water. Oh, and you're going to have to learn to say g'day. Of course, every day's a good day in Australia. G'day, Paul. G'day, love. Of course, you'll have to get used to some of the local customs, like getting a suntan at a restaurant, playing football without a helmet, and calling everyone mate. Thanks, mate. She's right, mate. Apart from that, no worries. You'll have the time of your life in Australia. Of course, we talk the same language. Although you lot do have a funny accent. Oh, before you rush out to book your Aussie holiday, get the Aussie holiday book from your airline or travel agent. Come on, come and say good day. I'll slip an extra shrimp on the barbie for you. America's discovered the wonders down under. Have you? Called shrimp on the barbie to encourage tourists and Australians to use hitchhiking as one of their many ad campaigns. Later, when hitchhikers started to disappear, then they started to travel more in pairs and not alone all the time anymore. So let's get back to where the two bodies were found in Belangolo State Forest. So the two bodies that were found were separated by around 30 meters distance between each of them. The police identified the bodies via dental records and confirmed them to be Joanne Walters and Caroline Clark. They were both British travelers and Joanne was actually working as a nanny, a trained nanny, and she was looking after children and working in Australia at the time. And Joanne met Caroline at a backpackers lodge where they became really good friends and decided that they were going to travel Australia together to try and find more jobs to stay in Australia for longer. But however, when they left Sydney, that was actually the last time that they were seen alive. In April 1992, Joanne and Caroline started to travel together by train um, to Hume, the highway near Belangolo State Forest, and then from there they would hitchhike the rest of the way to Adelaide. But unfortunately that was not meant to be. Uh, the two bodies that were found, remember Joanne, she was unfortunately stabbed 14 times, four times in the chest, once in the neck, nine times in the back, and some of the strikes that were in her back actually severed her spinal cord which uh, actually paralyzed her. So when they looked at Joanne's body they did notice that her jeans were undone except the button at the top was tied but everything else the zipper was undone and Caroline had been shot 10 times in the head and police disturbingly thought that she was used as target practice for the killer. Caroline also had the same stab wounds in the back which, have, which would have also paralyzed her. Near the bodies was a makeshift campsite with cigarette butts lying around and also some 22 caliber casings. Based on the bullets in Caroline's skull and the bullets around the campsite, the police could determine that the weapon used was a Ruger 22 caliber rifle. However, this did not help the police because they were thousands of these type of rifles around Australia at the time. While the police were busy investigating this crime scene, they noticed that the person who must have done this not only would have had knowledge with rifles and weapons in general, but they would have also had the knowledge of how and where to, to stab someone in the back in order to paralyze them. About a week after Caroline and Joanne's bodies were found, the police did do quite a thorough search of the area 
they didn't find much in the area so they stopped looking they did however think that this was this was not a, a case of a serial killer this was one person doing this and even with the amount of evidence that they did find um, the case unfortunately went cold for quite some time forensic psychiatrist dr rod milton did actually create a criminal profile in order to help the police with this case which was quite common and is still quite common he concluded that the killer was most likely male and in between his 30s and 40s. He had a history of aggression and was very, very familiar with guns. Also, he said that based on where and how the victims were killed, the killer would have a very good knowledge of the area. And unfortunately, the person that they were dealing with clearly liked to inflict pain and have control of others, according to Dr. Ron Moulton. He also said that the type of terrain that the victims were killed in told a lot about the type of killer that they were um, trying to look for because it showed that he was more of a macho man who liked rugged type of terrain and the killer in order to feel more powerful would take his victims to an area where, he, where they didn't know and they would feel completely powerless but dr rod milton just like the police also did not think that this was done by a serial killer he believed though that the victims were killed by more than one person because of the ways that they were killed because they were shot and they were stabbed one is a close range type of killing and another is a distance type of killing Sadly, at the time, the police did not know that Joanne and Caroline were not the only victims of the Belangelo State Forest. So about a year later, one of the local residents around the area was busy collecting firewood in the State Forest, Belangelo State Forest, and he actually came across a skull that was lying in the middle of plain sight. The man actually was terrified that the killer would come back or had more victims or was actually still in the forest. So he put the skull in his jumper and ran straight out the forest. He went to the police station with the skull in his jumper and led the police to where he found the, the body. Because this wasn't the first victim that they found, the police, the Australian police actually set up a task team to help find the Belangelo State Forest killer. And this task team was made up of about 300 police officers. So when police came back to the scene of the crime where the man showed them where they found the skull, they found two bodies. So the third and fourth bodies were identified as James Gibson and Deborah Everless. They were two teenagers from Victoria, both aged 19 at the time. Actually told their friends that they wanted to hitchhike to a festival down the Hume Highway. Tragically, James had been stabbed eight times and James had also had his spine severed, which had left him paralyzed. And according to the police, James's pants were also undone, but the top button was left done. The zipper was down. And interesting enough, this may be meant to the police and um, who they were looking for that the killer did not have a preference for men or women but however just like James and just like Joanne who both had their pants undone their bodies were way too decomposed to figure out if there was any indecent assault that had taken place but the police now saw that by this very small detail that was similar between the two bodies they now figured that they were dealing with the same killer unfortunately Deborah had also been badly beaten her skull had been fractured in two places and she was also stabbed in the back the bodies of James and Deborah were found only 600 meters away from where Joanne and Caroline's bodies were found. Also, another makeshift campsite was also found near the bodies with bullet casings and cigarette butts around the floor. And police actually had found James's backpack about 120 kilometers away from Belangelo State Forest. Inside his backpack was his camera and his wallet. Around the time that the police had found James and Deborah's body, a man named Alex Milat had called police to say that he saw in the forest one night some car which looked to have had two females in the back of the car tied up and police thought this is pretty weird that this guy would call now and say that he saw car, a car with women tied up in the back and not call when the incident was happening but they didn't really investigate too much into this at the time now when they were dealing with Deborah and James but they would come back to them later so after Deborah and James's bodies were found, a policeman was walking through a clearing in the Belangelo State Forest and he actually came across another body. He only saw this body because he saw a boot that was sticking up amongst the debris. It was a very, very shallow grave. The remains were identified as those of Simone Schmidl, who was last seen hitchhiking in order to look for work and she was a German tourist. On January 20th, 1991, she intended to catch a bus to Liverpool before hitchhiking along the Hume Highway to get to Melbourne. Simone also was found with eight stab wounds on her body. 
and two had actually hit the back of her spine again, leaving her paralyzed. And sadly, Simone was also stabbed in the heart. There was also a makeshift campsite near Simone's body with cigarette butts and bullets casings. When police were investigating the crime scene around Simone's body, they identified a pair of jeans that didn't belong to Simone. She was wearing hers. And they later established that these pair of jeans actually belonged to another missing person. The police searched the area and they found two more bodies. The bodies were identified to be 20-year-old Anya Habshid and Gabor Nugabawa, who was 21. Anya had just finished her studies and she really wanted to travel to Indonesia, but they actually saw Australia and were like, mm, let's just travel through to it. So they were planning on just traveling through Australia, getting to see all the different places and spent their Christmas in Sydney. The couple left their hostel on Boxing Day in 1991 and they planned a trip from Adelaide to Darwin, but unfortunately that was not meant to be. The couple were found in a very shallow grave, like I said earlier, and Anya had been stabbed eight times and had been decapitated with a single blow. Gabor was shot five times in the head and, and just like Caroline was believed to be target practice for the killer. Gabor's pants, like Joanne's and James, were also undone but tied by the button at the top. And just like Joanne and James, the bodies were too decomposed that they could not find um, evidence that there was any indecent assault. At this stage, uh, police could identify that the bullet casings that were found near Anya and Gabor's body were the same that were found near Joanne and Caroline's body. So now that seven people had been murdered, police had now seen, okay, there is actually a serial killer on hand. Through the media and through everyone talking about it, nicknamed the Backpack Killer. Because this case had been national news, it had now gone international and the police had set up little hotlines around the country in order to get tips from anywhere around the world and also within Australia. And through this hotline, the police were able to catch a lucky break from someone calling in to talk about something that they had experienced while they were on holiday in Australia. So Paul Onions was on a working holiday in Australia and he was hitchhiking from Sydney to Maldura on January 25th, 1990. So while Paul was hitchhiking, a car stopped and offered him a lift and a man named Bill offered him a ride. So Paul described him as being a very fit man, a very muscular man who also had a very, very thick mustache. Paul also said that he had black hair and drove a white pickup truck. And in the car, Paul described this man as asking him so many questions, continuously asking about his travel. And Paul said that while he was in this car with Bill, Bill, funny enough, started saying really controversial things and very indecent and rude things while he was in the car with so while they were driving, they lost radio reception and Bill thought, okay, let me get out the car. So he stopped the car near the Belangelo State Forest, just one turn before you turn into the forest. And Bill said to Paul that he would get cassette tapes because he doesn't want to drive the rest of the way in silence. But when Bill got out, Paul thought that maybe he would help Bill around the corner. So Paul opened his door and was about to get out to turn around the car to go help him. And Bill actually walked around the other side of the car and showed Paul a gun and was intending to rob him. So Paul sat back into the car but didn't close his door. And when he got back into the car, as Bill was walking back around the car, he looked under Bill's driver's seat and saw a bag that had some rope sticking out of the end of it. So rightfully so, Paul got really nervous about seeing this and obviously Bill had just showed him a gun and Paul decided, nope, I'm out of here. And he ran and he ran for his life. But while Paul was running, Bill started shooting at him. And luckily there was a lady who was driving down the road at the time and she stopped the car and took Paul to safety or to the nearest police station. And Paul had called the police and told them this whole story, but because there were so many calls coming in, it took only about five months for the police to actually look seriously into Paul's case. So once police started looking at Paul's statement, they saw that, oh, this is serious and we've got to look at this. And they quickly flew Paul back to Australia to ask them more questions about this. And while Paul was down in Australia, he, they, the police asked him to look at 13 different men and identify his, uh, the person who tried to attack him. And Paul identifies a man named Ivan Milak. And remember earlier in the story when they found the two bodies, James and Deborah, a man named Alex Milat had called in to talk about a suspicious vehicle that was carrying two tied up women in the back. Remember that? 
So Ivan Milat was born on 27 December 1944 in Guildford, New South Wales, Australia, about 100 kilometers away from Belangelo State Forest. His father was a Croatian immigrant who now stayed in Australia and his mother was an Australian born. His father's name was Stephen and his mother's name was Margaret. He had 13 siblings and Ivan was the fifth oldest of all the siblings. So even though their parents tried really hard to be strict with the Milat uh, siblings, they actually had a lot of trouble with the law. Ivan got into trouble with the law and was actually first caught around the age of 17. And these charges would include theft, robbery and armed robbery. In the 1990s, he seemed to be clearing up his act and actually worked as a road worker, um, which he had the job for 16 years. And by his neighbors, he was described as a really friendly person who would always go out of his way to help other people. But those who knew him very personally and very closely described him according to sources described him to be a control freak, sometimes a little bit violent, and to actually have slept with some of his brother's wives. So while the police were busy digging through Ivan's history and his criminal past, they actually found a crime that he committed back in the day that put him right to the top of the backpack killings. In 1971, he was charged with the abduction of two 18-year-old females and also the indecent assault of one of them. There were many years in between that it actually took him to get captured because he fled to New Zealand straight after he committed the crimes. So in 1974, when he returned to Australia, he was taken in by police and charged for those crimes, as well as a burglary charge. However, during the case, prosecutors could not make a convincing argument that Ivan was guilty of the uh, charges thrust upon him, and he was acquitted. Ivan actually stated during the trial that the interactions were consensual and the court could not disprove it, so that's why he was acquitted. So remember I told you that Ivan used to work along the Hume Highway as a road worker? Ivan even owned property within the Belangelo State Forest. So police went back to Alex Milat and questioned him about the previous statement that he said that he saw the two women at the back of the car who he assumed would be were tied up. And when they were done questioning him, Alex actually gave them a backpack and said that Ivan had given him this backpack and he just wanted to give it to police. And when police looked inside, it was the backpack that belonged to the German tourist Simone Schmidl. So with this evidence and Paul Onion's positive testimony and identification, on May 22nd, 1994, many police officers, including very heavily armed police officers, surrounded Ivan Malat's home. Before they entered, a police officer actually called inside Ivan Malat's home and Ivan answered and the, the, the police officer asked, is Ivan Milat home? <laughs> and Ivan said, no, he doesn't live here. He's not home. But police knew that Ivan Milat was lying. They had been doing surveillance on the home for quite some time before they raided the home. So police called two more times into Ivan's home. There was no answer. Eventually they tried again and Ivan's girlfriend answered the phone and she had no idea what was going on and she just handed the phone to Ivan and said here you need to deal with it, allegedly. So when Ivan was handed the phone he actually laughed at the police officers when they were calling him and said there are no police officers here you're just making a joke. He thought that it was one of his friends from work who, who was just trying to get back at him or just pulling a prank. But the police officers assured him, listen Ivan, this is not a prank, you need to come outside. So Ivan said, okay, I'm just going to put my pants on and then I'll come outside. And of course, no Ivan. So police called one more time and Ivan eventually left the house. And when Ivan left, um, his house was raided and Ivan was put in the back of a police car. When the police were raiding Ivan's home, they were surprised to find so many items of evidence inside his home. They found a lot of weapons inside his home, a lot of ammo inside. But most importantly, in a hole in the wall, they found the Aruga 22 caliber rifle, which was found to match exactly to the bullet casings that were left at all the crime scenes. Also found blood-stained rope, knives, cameras, camping equipment, as well as wallets belonging to the victim. Police even said that Ivan Milat was wearing some of the victim's clothes and remember I told you about Caroline Clark? She was wearing a jersey at the time that she was abducted and, and Ivan had actually given that jersey to his girlfriend to wear. So when questioned, Ivan actually stated that he had no idea where the weapons came from. He was just denying the whole thing the whole time. And while Ivan was actually being questioned and held at the police station, sources actually said that he seemed to be enjoying this type of attention of being questioned and everyone looking at him and just enjoying the spotlight. 
A week later, on May 30th, he was charged with killing all seven victims at the Belangelo State Forest. Two years later, in June 1966, was when Ivan's trial actually started. Ivan pled not guilty to all crimes, and the defense kept playing on the fact that they thought it was another Malat f um, family member that had actually done it, and Ivan was just taking the fall for another brother. However, the weapons found in Ivan's home, Paul Onion's testimony, and all the evidence was quite damning, and there was no proof that any other Malat um, family member was involved. The trial lasted 15 weeks and on July 27th 1996 the jury came back after two days of deliberation and found Ivan Malak guilty of all seven murders in the Belangelo State Forest. But Ivan Malak still maintains his innocence. So Ivan Malak received seven life sentences which means that he will be in jail for the rest of his life. In Australia I think the a life sentence is only around about 20 years but even with seven of them, he will still be there for a long time. And he was also charged with Paul Onion's abduction as well. So there were also extra charges added on there. During Iron's jail time, he tried so many times to um, inflict harm on himself. And he actually self-mutilated himself quite often, which included swallowing a razor blade. And he also tried to cut off his little finger in order to send it to the high court. Unfortunately, doctors could not save uh, his little finger. And when I, it's not funny, but when I read this, I just had to tell everyone. And in 2012, he actually went on a hunger strike in order to get a PlayStation. To this day, many people believe that Ivan Milat is actually still responsible for many more murders. He just hasn't confessed to them, but they haven't found enough evidence to point him to them. Interesting enough, when detectives were investigating this case more, they found that whenever Ivan was not in a relationship, that is when all of the killings or murders would happen. So they actually surmised that Ivan was in a relationship and he was able to be in control of someone or he was able to have control over someone. Then none of the murders would take place. But once he was single and he couldn't have that control over anyone anymore, that's when unfortunately all these murders would take place. So Ivan Malat died in prison on the 27th of October 2019, aged 74. And Ivan was actually fighting cancer um, for a while in prison and that was his cause of death. So when you go to the Belangelo State Forest, there is a memorial for the seven victim should you wish to visit that and that pretty much sums up that case that was a long one but it was quite a hectic one i'm quite interested to hear your thoughts of the belangelo state killer or the backpack killer let me know what you think please stay safe out there thank you so much for the support and thank you for watching if you've made it this far i hope to see you again soon thank you bye